lecture series. This is, I believe, lecture number seven in the series. Um, and we generally record and uh, stream these lectures so that people can go back to them or if you're not able to make it, that you can see them later uh, within our, our community. And um, we encourage you to change your name so that you indicate your, um, your location. And if you can put your cameras on a little bit so that your, the speaker can see his audience, that's always nice. Um, so I would uh, like to start now and introduce our speaker. Very delighted to have Jordan Cogner with us today. Jordan is an assistant professor in uh, the Stony Brook Linguistics Department, something that makes me absolutely delighted since it is my department. Jordan just joined us this past academic year, so he's in a way the, the newest, the youngest member of our department, um, which is really exciting for all of us. He got his MA and his PhD at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, working with Charles Yang and Mitch Marcus. He's primarily interested in computational linguistics, uh, algorithmic models of the uh, grammar acquisition, especially morphology, which we will hear about today. Um, he's also interested in language change and historical linguistics, also from a computational perspective. Um, he has many other interests, uh, including paleontology, Roman history, Singaporean English, and a whole bunch of things that we probably won't hear about today. Um, but I just wanted to uh, mention them because it's always really fun to talk to Jordan about almost anything. Um, and um, I would, I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, he is also a member of the Institute for Advanced Computational Science at Stony Brook. And he's going to talk to us today about uh, computational approaches to morphology acquisition. So um, please, a warm welcome for Jordan Cotton. Which can be like that. Take it away, Jordan. Thank you for the introduction. I have the chat open in a second monitor. So if you want to ask questions that way, I'll probably be pretty responsive. Today, I'm going to talk about computational approaches to morphology acquisition. So first, I think it's good to define, just as a refresher, what is language acquisition and what do I mean by it? This is the process by which children acquire their first or native languages. So as distinguished from second language learning that you might do later in life. And this is really a special learning process. It's unique to humans. No other species does this. It's also automatic. So as opposed to how you learn some other things later in life, it might be best to think of acquisition not as something that babies do. It's something that happens to them, sort of like you automatically learn to walk given a reasonable circumstance and opportunity to do so. Also, this is one of the things of a handful of things that we get worse at over time. So we're very good at acquiring our native language and we lose the ability to acquire languages natively after that. As I think anyone who's learned a second language in their teenage years or later has, has noticed. Language acquisition is interesting to me at least and I think to most people who are interested in it because it's really an immense challenge. There's no explicit teacher. You don't get lessons on how to learn your native language like how you would to learn second language. We'll talk about this in more detail. I'm gonna claim there's really not a lot of evidence given to the child. And there are no negative examples either. So this turns out to make learning a lot harder as well. So stepping back a little, we can talk about what learning involves in general. I think this is really useful because if we wanna do computational linguistics with language acquisition, we'd like to be able to formalize the learning problem somewhat. And this is what I'm going to focus on today, rather than talking about the approaches themselves. I'm going to talk about the sorts of benchmarks that an approach should meet in order to be a good model of morphology acquisition. So the first of those four things is a learner. In our case, we're talking about a child, but not really the whole child, right? We're just talking about the part of the child that learns languages. You can think of this as a learning algorithm. But and if, you, if you've ever read about psychology experiments on learning, the learner is often a pigeon, or maybe we just care about the brain. 
And the formal underpinnings, though, also apply to a machine learning system. We're not just talking about living things necessarily when we're talking about learning. And so that allows us to do a lot of computational morphology. The next thing we learn, perhaps obviously, is something to, is something. We have to learn something. So we're we as humans learn a language or really a grammar. We can think about learning different parts of the grammar because learning a whole language is a very complicated process. But also this learning could be learning how to drive a car or learning how to solve a maze or learning how to write your name or so on. The next thing we need is a learning environment. So this is where we're getting the input from. So the child just absorbing ambient language around them, or you're learning something in a class, or a mouse in a maze with some food and it needs to find the food. There are lots of questions we can ask about the learning environment. So is the evidence positive? So we're only getting like good, good examples, like the cheese is in this part of the maze, or negative, like don't go that way, the cheese isn't there, or both. Do we know, is there a known order or distribution of the information that we're getting? So you can imagine learning a language where we conveniently give the child all the words one right after another that they need. That's not really how it works, but that's something that's technically possible. And we can ask a question of, well, how much evidence is there? So how many words does the child hear during their first few years of life? The next thing we need to more formally describe learning is a hypothesis case. So this is, this is the set of possibilities that one could learn. So if you're learning to solve a maze, the hypothesis space is all the possible paths through the maze. If you're learning a language, it is all the possible grammars or all the possible components of all the possible grammars. Or if you're a pigeon learning that when a bell is rung, you're gonna get food, that hypothesis space would be things in the environment like bells and outcomes. Or you could be learning the shapes of rectangles or you can be learning the sets of positive integers. The hypothesis space makes all the difference and it can make an impossible learning problem possible. So th these are the, uh, this is a very high and somewhat an informal attempt to formalize the things that go into formal learning. So we can think about language acquisition as a learning paradigm. If we combine all of these, we have what's called a learning paradigm. So I have attempted to formalize this a little bit more. You can say that, that language acquisition is a learning algorithm that takes uh, language in the environment. So a finite site set of input utterances L, which are drawn from some language. And what you get, what you learn is a grammar. The hypothesis space is the set of possible grammars. What you learn is a specific grammar. So in this function notation, we can say acquisition is a function H. I used H just like for hypothesis that takes linguistic input, so samples of language, and outputs a grammar, or outputs a set of grammars, or something like that. And we'll come back to this characterization a couple of times. And I think also now is a good time to ask for any quick questions and speak up or put them in the chat. If not, I'll keep going. OK, so for the next few slides, I'm going to uh, characterize the input. So this is the, the early linguistic input that children receive on the basis of which they learn their grammars. There are some really important questions here. How much input does the child receive? How are morphological forms distributed in the input? What kinds of evidence does the input provide? Uh, a, a computational model for morphology acquisition really should work well on the kinds of inputs that a child actually gets. Otherwise, you might be learning something, but you're not really doing acquisition, right? You, you've, you're solving a different learning problem. And the biggest takeaway here, this is I, uh, just a huge theme in language acquisition is that the input is sparse. And we'll quantify a bit how sparse it actually is. I think this is one of the major takeaways you should have from today. The input is sparse, sparser than you think. So when parents speak to children, parents or other caregivers speak to children, we call this child-directed speech. Children learn from child-directed speech as well as just other language they hear in their environment. 
This is often called, uh, traditionally called motherese. And it is in some ways different from regular speech, but in a lot of ways, it's not really. So you might find exaggerated prosody, slower and shorter phrases, more focus on the present than the past and future. And it's been argued that all of these facilitate acquisition to an extent. You'll notice that a lot of these are syntactic or uh, phonetic related. So motherese, it can help for development, but it turns out it's outweighed by other factors. Children don't need motherese to learn. So what we care about child directed speech is that it's input in general and not specifically that it is the special kind of input. So to start off, we can ask this question that I've already posed a couple of times. How many words of input does it take to learn a native language? And I'll pose this to all of you. You can guess in the chat how many tokens of how, like individual words do you think a child might hear in their first three or so years of life? I, gen I generally expect, I ask this question a lot, I generally expect people to get the answer wrong because how would you know if you don't already know? Two to 3,000 words. So two to 3,000 is that types or tokens. So is that like two to 3,000 unique words or do we allow repeats? Say we allow repeats, how many words? Three years. Thousand unique words. Okay, now how many words with repeats? 600. Okay, now I'll reveal the answer. So, in terms of unique words, I'll get to that in a moment. But for total words, including repeats, it's about 10 to the seventh tokens. So, that's on the order of 10 million. So, it's like maybe 30 million words in three years of life. So, is that a lot or a little? is the question. I don't know, in some circumstances, that's a lot. If you have uh, that many dollars, you'd be in a great position. But if you have that many grains of sand, that's like nothing, right? So there are a couple of ways that we can answer, is this a big number or not? One way is to take a step back and look at what's going on in NLP and machine learning. So last year, uh, a deep learning system for a language called GPT-3 came out. It's been making headlines consistently since then. It's capable of doing all kinds of interesting things. It can't do everything, but it, it does solve a lot of things pretty well. So then we can ask, well, how many tokens of input do they give to GPT-3 to make it do that? And that is 5.7 times 10 to the 11. So that's thousands of times what an average three-year-old has heard. It's actually more than you'll hear in your entire lifetime. Oh, and this is, they gave it input from many languages. This is just the English. So this is an absurd amount of input. Uh, 10 to the 11th is 5.7 times 10 to the 11th is 570 billion tokens. So this is terabytes of data. And they gave it text. So text, it already has word segmentation a child would have to learn where the word boundaries are and it would have to learn something about the phonetics and the phonology. We can just ignore all of that with GPT-3 and it still doesn't do as well as a human. So that this, this means that that 10 to the seventh is actually quite a small number. Another way to look at that, specifically for morphology is a measure that we call paradigm saturation. So this is, well, given some paradigm like this, this is something, this is Spanish, something you might see in a classroom when learning a foreign language, but not something that's provided to the child. How many of these forms is the child actually gonna hear in say a, a year of input? And I'm willing to take guesses again, like what given a language has this many forms in it for a verb, given a year, this, is, this verb means to, to speak, it's a pretty common verb. You can guess a percentage, what percentage of these some might someone hear. Two thirds. That's a reasonable guess, because this is a frequent verb. One third. That's also a reasonable guess. Turns out for this specific verb, one third is very close. So given a few million words of speech, you might find this many forms. The most frequent verb which means to say is around two thirds actually. 
So that's why both of these were good guesses. And now, now here's the fun one. Want to guess the ab for the average verb in a few million words of speech? How many forms are you going to come across? Right, and so the, this does vary by paradigm size, which I'll get to. Well, for Spanish, it turns out the median is about one form per verb. So this is a less common verb. So if you are a learner of Spanish, you've seen a couple verbs like this, but most verbs, you only get one form. And now your job is to be able to fill out the rest of this. Given the right circumstance, you need to be able to produce any of these forms. So this is also a very significant challenge. This is an example of sparsity. Now, to make matters worse, some forms here, so the second person plural and perfect subjunctive turns out to be the least common form in Spanish if you take really any corpus. A speaker might never, ever hear or produce this form of this verb, but they still know it, right? It's in the grammar. The grammar is able to generate this. So this, this is a big challenge. So we can talk now about the distribution of these paradigm saturations. So I said some of these most common verbs have maybe 30%, 70% paradigm saturation in Spanish, but the mean is only one. We can talk about, well, how, how are these saturations distributed? They follow something called Zipp's law, which is a long-tailed frequency distribution that shows up a lot in language and other things. If we rank the verbs by their paradigm saturation, we'll find that they're proportional to one over their, uh, their saturations proportional to one over their, their rank. This is long tailed because there'll be a few items that are extremely common. So this is, these are just for uh, total frequency in English. There are a few words that are quite common and then most words are gonna be very rare. So they'll have very low paradigm saturation. Almost all of them will only have one or two forms, then you'll get a few like to speak and to say that have a lot. Uh, like I said, Zipf's law is actually quite common in language. It all comes all over the place. It also shows up outside of language. So one of my famous favorite examples is that if you were to take a pumpkin and drop it off a building, and you measured the distance at which each pumpkin chunk went from the point that it hit the ground and plotted them, they would follow one of these long tail distributions. If you look, if you go on, if you look at a catalog or you're doing online shopping and you look at how often various products sell, the rate of sales will follow the Zipian distribution. Uh, neuron activations follow this. The way pumpkin, the way penguins group on the ice follows this. City populations do. It's, it's quite common. And so, like I said, paradigm saturation also follows this sort of distribution. So here I took uh, child-directed speech and non-child-directed speech and just made some plots of paradigm saturation. I put smaller paradigms on the left and larger ones roughly on the right. So Finnish and Turkish uh, nouns have, I think this was nouns, have very large possible paradigms. And as a result, you get these extremely sparse distributions where the x-axis is the is the items by paradigm saturation rank and the y-axis is by paradigm saturation. So relating to Omer's uh, question from earlier, English verbs actually, they don't have a lot of possible forms, right? Only five really. So like a stem or infinitive form, the present third person singular, the past, the past participle and the progressive. And as a result, and you can see these five steps here, uh, they're just less sparse. English is less sparse than, say, German or Spanish. Or I just think it's cool that you can get corpora for dead languages and do this as well for Gothic and Latin or from Finnish and Turkish and so on. And also another thing to point out here is that here these yellow ones are, are child-directed speech and these blue ones are from modern like news and web stuff. You get the same sorts of patterns in child-directed speech that you get in other data as well. This is just a really kind of unavoidable universal statistical fact about language use. 
So what we conclude here is that paradigm saturation is very sparse, and it means that the child does not hear most of the forms that they could possibly want to produce. Even in English, this is less than 50%. And English is about as good as it gets, real, as, assuming you have any sort of inflection morphology at all. For something like Turkish, it is well under 90%. I mean, well over 90% of forms are just not there. Yet, of course, a native Turkish speaker can produce them. And so this slide relates to the, the way people answered a question earlier. We can, we can estimate the number of unique words that a child knows at the time that they're acquiring most of their morphology. And here I put up number estimates from, from English and German. You can find similar numbers. I found them for Spanish and Mandarin, for example. There's a lot of variation, but it's really a few hundred words at the age of two to three that a child knows which means that they're acquiring their morphology on the basis of relatively small amount of lexical knowledge relative to an adult. You might not know 10, 20 times as many types as, as a three-year-old. And on the basis of this extremely sparse data. So uh, a learning algorithm should be able to navigate this problem and still do well, right? So this is the setting in which a computational model should be able to perform. So the next thing I want to talk about is negative evidence. It's possible that some of you have, have heard discussions about this already. This is sort of an old thing that comes up again and again in linguistics. So the higher level point is that if you have negative feedback, it makes learning easier. So the example I like to give is imagine a math, imagine you're in math class. And you only ever see correct answers. Uh, you, you're never told you're wrong when you're wrong. Now, try to learn that way. That would be much harder than if, I mean, you, you'd get a good grade probably, but it'd be much harder to learn that way, right? So you wouldn't be able to see, oh, I did it right versus I did it wrong. If you make a mistake, how do you even know you've made a mistake? Or imagine you're in a foreign language class and you never correct it. You just kind of speak the way you want to or you're learning how to drive and you're never told what to do, that's just dangerous. So if you have negative feedback, all of these become easier. Like I'm not sure one could learn math if one is never corrected. Then there's this, there's a really large body of research on negative evidence and formal or mathematical learnability. It's provable that, that certain learning problems are only possible if you have negative evidence. So then there's this question, well, what kind of negative evidence is present during acquisition and how useful is it and how is it used? Because if negative evidence is present, this could help us overcome the sparsity problem. Well, people have looked at this a lot. One issue is that caregivers will only sometimes correct their children. So, I mean, you may have noticed this with younger siblings or with children of your own. Caregivers are more likely to correct factual errors or mispronunciations or certain kinds of morphological errors than others. And this is a problem because the probability of receiving an explicit correction given an error is relatively small. So we see that when parents correct children, if they even bother to, they don't do it very often. So most errors are gonna slide. So then people asked, well, since, since uh, this explicit negative feedback is kind of a non-starter, people then started to ask, well, what about implicit negative evidence? So instead of getting direct feedback, so instead of your math teacher telling you you're wrong, they sort of like hint that you're wrong. Like maybe if you're wrong, they make a face at you, like an upset face rather than telling you you're wrong and how to fix it. That would still be helpful, right? So it turns out that caregivers are more likely to repeat a child's evident utterance verbatim back to them if they were correct. So that's a signal the child could use. They're more likely to repeat a rephrasing instead if the child is incorrect. That's another signal a child could use. They're more likely to ask for clarification if the child is incorrect. The problem is probably none of these are particularly helpful because they're all very weak signals. It turns out 
the child is only slightly more likely to receive negative feedback, even implicit like this, if they were incorrect. And they may accidentally receive negative feedback anyway if they are correct. So why is that? Well, mishearing is quite common. Even in conversations between adults, it's possible to mishear things. And most mishearings go unnoticed, right? You need some sort of coincidence to notice someone misunderstood something. And if you've listened to a small child talk, they're, they can be really hard to understand, right? So they're not quite up to speed with their own phonology yet. What are they even saying a lot of the time? So, that, so that could cause a parent to make corrections when, it wasn't, when they weren't supposed to. So in this study, which I think is the one from Marcus 93, these curves show the probability of a correction given the child said something ungrammatical, this bold line, or the child said something grammatical, this not bold line. And you see these distributions seriously overlap. So it'd be very hard to say if your child and were corrected, whether you were actually made a mistake or whether you were actually right and you were just misheard. To make matter worse, the child doesn't know these distributions. These were measured after the fact by the researcher. So if you're a child trying to make sense of implicit negative evidence, you're really out of luck because you have, you have basically no idea if you were corrected whether or not you should listen to that correction. I hope, that, I hope this makes sense. So really negative evidence in any form is really doomed. It's a non-starter. So misunderstandings are common even between adults. So I, I was looking at a sociolinguistics uh, chapter by Bill LeBov about this, where they estimated that really up to 10% of utterances between two adult native speakers involve some kind of misunderstanding. That's a very big number if you think about it. 10% of what you're saying to your family, they're not correctly understanding. Most of those just go unnoticed. You really need some sort of coincidence to notice them. And then most interesting linguistic phenomena are rare. So if you say some form going way back to this table from earlier that hard, that's hardly ever said, what are the chances someone will hear it and give you useful feedback? It's very low. So also in this Marcus paper, they estimated for, it was for a syntactic issue, roughly how many incorrect utterances you would need to be corrected on before you could reasonably say that it was wrong and you were corrected. It turns out to be about 86. Most forms only appear once or twice in, in millions of words. You're never going to get enough evidence for negative evidence to, to use negative evidence usefully. Caregivers also differ in how much feedback they provide, just like they differ in how much motherese they're using. Children acquire language just fine, even if they have caregivers who don't give them negative feedback. So this is clearly not necessary. And then the last thing is, even if the child could notice the negative evidence, they're very resistant to correction. So this is the famous thing. If you try to correct children, they just uh, largely ignore you. So in this example, the child said something ungrammatical in English, nobody don't like me, where it really should be nobody likes me. So the mother tries to correct the child. No, say nobody likes me. But the child repeats the error. Nobody don't like me. And this goes back and forth eight times. You can imagine the mother is extremely frustrated at this point. Finally, no, now listen carefully. Say, nobody likes me. And the child still gets it wrong. They make a, nobody don't likes me. So they have incorrectly corrected this. I also found this example on YouTube of a child trying to learn lexical items that I'll play for you. I think this also demonstrates the point. What do you got there? Oh, I have Stay in the chat if you can't hear it. Apples. Yeah, apples. Hey, Sebastian, what's this? What is this? Apple. It's not an apple, it's an orange. What is it? Apple. It's not an apple, it's an orange. Apple? You no, sure? Oh, it's an orange. Apple. Apple. Orange. Apple. Apple. It's not an it's apple. It's an orange. Silly a baby. Apple. Apple. Are you sure? Apple. No, apple. Uh, maybe you're talking about a real apple. This is an apple. That's no, an apple. Apple. That's an apple. And what's this? Apple. 
This is an orange. Apple. Orange. This is an apple. Apple. That's an apple. Apple. Says apple. Qua. apple. No. Orange. Oh, orange. There, you there you go. Orange. Good. So this was about as an, ex as an explicit a learning environment as you can be when you're acquiring your language. You don't learn most words this way, not, not to mention morphology, it turns out. By the end of this video, the child does say orange. So the parents are seem to believe the child now knows the word orange. I'm not entirely sure. We'd have to keep watching to know. But even so, this is a ridiculous amount of back and forth. The child just does not want to call that thing anymore. I think this makes that point. What do you got there? Okay. So the data that I got to make the paradigm saturation stuff and the data that was used to look at some of this negative evidence stuff comes from a large database called the Childish Project. You can access online, just Google Childish, or you can follow this link. It's a collection of all kinds of different acquisition corpora and other resources. Most of them are free to use. There are a lot of really famous corpora in here, and it's available for many languages. North American English is the most common, but there are several European and Asian languages as well. So I really recommend looking at childless. I'll just go over briefly what you might get in a childless corpus. This is uh, Sarah from the Brown Corpus. Every file, you'll start with a header here that is a lot of useful information. And if, if, you, if you know how to program, generally what one will do is write something to parse all the information out of this. So here it tells you what language it is. This is English. The names and codes for the participants. Here there's a child called Sarah for, who, who has the code CHI for child, a mother, two investigators, and an adult family friend named Russ. Okay. This is actually a pretty old corpus. It's from 1963. So uh, Sarah is, I assume she's still around. She's probably in around 60 now. It says how long it is. And then here's a little bit of information about what's going on in this environment. So Russ is a family friend, apparently. Yeah, so someone points out that the baby may have thought that apple is the general word for all fruit or all around objects, that's pretty likely. That kind of over overextension happens quite a bit. And so in this correction, the parents are trying to tell the child essentially then that apple is not the general word for all fruit, which it, it actually was in Old English, but not anymore. It's a specific, a specific kind of fruit. So after the header in a child is file, you'll get the body. And this is where the real information is. So on all of these lines that start with a star, you have actually what was said in by whom. So here the child says, my dolly. The family friend repeats, my dolly. And it kind of just goes on with this discussion. A lot of these are really cute to read because they're interactions with little kids. Relevantly for us, you'll get a bunch of these extra lines, which they call tiers, that start with a percent. This is the morphology tier, which has part of speech tagging. So it's saying that my is a possessive determiner, doll is a noun, and so on. It will also have lemmatization. So this is English. We don't really have a bunch of inflection to look at, unfortunately, but you can still see some. So for example, dolly is the diminutive of doll, so a small doll. And you have doll here. And then you have information about affixes. So this IE is a diminutive suffix. And then punctuation is pulled out just to make parsing it easier. So this is very useful. All kinds of other information might be present. So these are our dependency parses to do a very shallow sort of syntactic analysis if you want. I'm not going to go into how to read these. I don't particularly like them. Sometimes if it's in a language other than English, there'll be a percent TRA tier for translation. And then sometimes you get these comment tiers, which just saying various things. Like here, there was a bunch of adult, the conversation between the adults 
but we don't really care about that. We care about the input to the child and the child, so they just didn't transcribe it. Nowadays, they probably would have, but this was almost 60 years ago. Uh, we've gotten better at this. Okay, so any questions about that before I, I change things up a little bit? Okay. So changing gears, productivity is the ability to generalize patterns to unseen forms. And so we can distinguish productive patterns from unproductive ones. Productivity turns out to be a central problem in morphological acquisition, because as we saw with paradigm saturation, most forms, most of the forms in that paradigm have to be inferred, because they're never heard, right? So you need to be able to generalize some pattern in order to figure out what to even produce. Productivity is also really interesting because it provides a window into the organization of the grammar. So you can see what is productive and what isn't. That'll tell you something about how the morphology is organized, for example. The most classic example used in discussions of productivity is English past tense. So you might think of English past tense as relatively straightforward. It is actually surprisingly complicated once we get into the details of it. English past pasts are productively formed with the suffix ed. This is subject to some morphophonological variation. But there, there are many exceptions. And those of you who are second language speakers of English uh, were probably annoyed having to learn these. This is just a small sample. There are quite a there are quite a bit of these, like sing sang, sting stung, ride, road, hide, hit, go, went, hit, hit, run, ran, and so on. These are generally not phonologically predictable. So you really do have to memorize them. So you have sing sang, but sting stung. Some speakers do say sting. There's ride road, but hide hid. No native speaker would ever say hoed here. Or fall fell, but call kel, that's not kel. Or fly flew, but by bot, it's not boo. And it's not fly flot either. These to a native speaker sound ridiculous. No one would say this. So this is something that has to be learned. There, there are a few in, important insights into how productivity works and is learned. One is an observation called U-shaped learning, which is often observed in the acquisition of morphological systems. Not always, and it has to do with the specific system being learned, but it is known for English past tense. So the observation here is that very young children will actually produce irregulars accurately. So from a very young age, they'll say stuff like sing, sang, or go, went correctly. But then they get worse at it. So they'll suddenly start producing classic over-irregularization error. So instead of went, they'll suddenly say goed, and node instead of new, or sleeped instead of slept. So they've gotten worse in, in surface performance that older children gradually relearn the irregulars. And this sort of pattern happens for many languages. And so here's an example of this. This is from Adam from the brown corpus that we saw earlier. The open circles here are the, the rate at which Adam correctly produces irregulars. So very young Adam, so under three years old, 100%, always saying things like when. Then all of a sudden, he makes a mistake. And then he's still generally good, but he continues to make mistakes up until age five. After this, presumably, he gets better again. The closed circles here are the, the percentage of times that he actually bothers making a past, a regular past tense form. So you'll note that when he's very young, he usually doesn't make regular paths correctly. He just uses the, the infinitive or the stem, which are hard to distinguish in English. Suddenly, though, he, it's, like, it's like a switch now. Oh, ED is productive. I can use this to make paths whenever I want. And it rockets up in correctness. That's the same time that he starts over-regularizing. So, so here's how we might interpret it. At first, he's just memorized everything, correct? Memorized these sing-sang pairs. He doesn't know that you can use ED productively. Then he realizes it. And he goes kind of crazy with it. He, he just kind of tries to use ED on all kinds of things. And then over time, he gradually gets better. So we can ask, 
one way this might happen is that at first he's just memorizing everything, including regular paths of the present past pair. Then he realizes ED is the rule and goes wild with it. And then he gradually tapers off and becomes more adult like. One class, one probably fame, the most famous way that we can test productivity in children is something called the WUG test paradigm, which some of you have probably heard of before. The question is, can a young learner inflect words that they've never heard before? This would show that they know a productive pattern and we're not just memorizing pairs like young Adam was. So in this study, the original one is from Jean Burko, 1958. They presented some drawing, said, well, this is a WUG, where a WUG is a, a nonce word, a made up word that they can't possibly have heard before. Then now, there, now there's another one. There are two of them. There are two. And then they would hope that the they would see if the child could produce the plural. If they, if they know to add S to make the plural, this means that they know that S is productively how you make plurals in English. Otherwise, maybe they're just memorizing the plurals. So they actually tried this out in this in the original study for a lot of things. So they tried it out for verbal morphology as well. So here, this is a man who knows how to glean. And again, this strange action no child would have ever seen. He is glinging. He did the same thing yesterday. What did he do yesterday? Yesterday he, and this would prompt the child to make the task. So we could then test whether the child knows how to make past tense forms in English. So he does it, so this guy is luging, he does it every day. These are, so they also tried it for third person singular and for the progressive, so for all the forms. English doesn't have a ton of inflection and morphology. So you can just test everything. Here for some other nouns, the tor and the crow. And this one is for adjectives. So this dog has quirks on him. This dog has more quirks on him. And this dog has even more quirks on him. This dog is quirky. I'm assuming quirky was just not a common word in the 50s. It, it is in modern English. So I think they're trying to get comparative and superlative adjectives. They're, they, they're, they want to see if the child will say quirkier and quirkiest in this case. So overall, the, we can also use child production errors to figure out something about productivity. To summarize, there are really two significant asymmetries in what kinds of errors children produce. One is these over-regularization errors that we saw earlier are way, way more common than over-irregularization errors, which are almost unheard of. So for English past tense, that'll be using ED instead of the irregular form, but you pretty much never see it going the other direction. It just doesn't happen. So this means we're seeing the productive forms being extended rather than unproductive forms because they're unproductive. It really wouldn't make sense to do that. The other is, you could say errors of omission are more frequent than errors of commission. Errors of omission are when the child deletes inflectional morphology. It's like just producing the lemma or the infinitive or something instead of the inflected form. While commission would be just using the wrong form, like instead of the past tense, you're using the progressive or something. That'd be very strange and we don't see that. So for Adam, we see that early on, Adam uses the bare stem instead of ED to make the path. Those are errors of omission. You don't see them using random other forms. Or I liked the study from Dean 2005 of Swahili learners. When they produce a verb, they should have subject agreement, tense marking, the root and mood, all these morphemes. That's mostly what they do, but it's pretty common for children to drop any of these in any combination, really. So these are errors of omission. He also looked at something called root infinitives, where you're making the infinitive instead. And in Swahili, these are quite uncommon, a very low percentage of errors. So to come back to this, this is the language acquisition learning paradigm. We talked some, some about the learner and the learning environment, right? So very sparse, no negative evidence. Children make over-regularization errors and omission errors, not over-irregularization errors or commission errors. We haven't talked as much about the hypothesis space or the learning algorithm itself. And I think I'm 
running low on time, but I have some more slides about that. I'm happy you can to take a, you can take a little bit more time because we started a little late. So. Okay, and I'm happy at any time to stop for questions again. So I wanted to introduce one model of productivity learning that I that's relatively straightforward. So this is a, a model for the acquisition of linguistic generalizations or productivity. You can think of it as an evaluation metric over a linguistic hypothesis. So a child might make a hypothesis. Oh, I think ED should be used to make the path because I am seeing it a lot. And you can use this to decide, you the child can use this to decide whether, or not, whether a pattern with exception could be productive. So if it's productive, you would learn ED and then you still have to memorize the exceptions. If it's not productive, you would memorize the ED as well. So here's how we formulate that. Given, given a hypothesized generalization, this quantitatively tells us the number of exceptions below which the generalization is tenable. So if n is the number of types that should obey the generalization, so say the number of verbs in, that the child knows in English, remember the child knows at most a couple hundred verbs at age three, e is the number of types that don't obey it. So the number of exceptions that the child has learned so far, like sing sing. We say that as long as the number of exceptions is less than this formula, n divided by the natural log of n, that's, that's not too many exceptions. And we're good. We'll, we'll, we'll learn ED. There are some uh, important points to make here. So these numbers are the properties of each individual, not just of some corpus. This is meant to be a cognitive model of productivity learning. n is the number of class members that the child has learned so far. So as the child learns more verbs, for example, they'll have to recalculate this. And it happens because of the math that you can learn generalizations more permissively on a small vocabulary than a large vocabulary. So on a vocabulary, the size that the child is actually exposed to, we talked about the input, rather than a really huge GPT-3 size vocabulary. So I just want to go over that again on a number line. Oh, maybe looking at it visually will help. So the number line goes from zero to n, which is the number of items uh, a generalization could potentially apply to. Theta here is this threshold. If and then e is going e, the number of exceptions is going to be somewhere on the number line. If e falls below this threshold, we'll say, okay, acquire the pattern, learn ed, and just memorize the exception. And that turns, that's what happens in English, of course. If it's bigger than that, we say, okay, too many exceptions. This is not a good rule. We shouldn't learn this. And then, like I said, as the child learns more vocabulary, n is going to grow. So this number line is going to stretch. And it's possible that, that E will start off in the bad range. And as the child learns more words, it turns out to fall in the good range. Or it can go the other way around. So say if you're very young, you just happen to have heard too many exceptions early. But as you grow and your N grows, so a pattern can fall into productivity or fall out of productivity during development. So this is the last thing I had. And I'm happy to go over the tolerance principle more. I went through it pretty fast. This is some recent work that I did with some collaborators at Michigan and Penn and ISI, where we use the tolerance principle in a computational model for learning morphological generalizations. We called it ATP. This is being presented, I think, today or tomorrow at the COGSI conference. So this has a lot of benefits because we took into account what we actually know about the acquisition setting. So we use a child-sized data set that could be taken from childish, and we, and we can use it to work out regular and irregular patterns, and we can learn their conditioning rules. This works by constructing a, a decision tree, so sort of breaking up conditions that the child or you, the researcher, can follow through. We don't do a lot of like, phonological cleanup afterwards. This can look a little bit messy. So for English, it finds 
three productive past tense forms. These happen to be all of the allomorphs of ED. So if you have a verb like walk, walked, that ends in a voiceless segment like K, it takes a T to make the past. Otherwise, depending on the ending sound, it'll either be id, with a, an example off the top of my head, or just the plain D. So these are the three allomorphs of ED in English. And it says that nothing else is productive. So I drag, dragged, or box, boxed, like to put something in a box. That's not it either. I don't know. There's something. We also tried it for more complicated patterns. So this is for German noun plurals. And it turns out there are a whole lot of phonological and semantic conditions on German noun plurals. So what the root ends in, what the gender of the noun is, and so on, you actually get a really complicated sequence. And this doesn't quite work perfectly because it should have, and I think it should have ended up with S as a default, but it came very close. It was right except for that. So it makes this sort of decision tree based on, on the tolerance principle, which it uses to say whether generalization is good, and then also an algorithm for, for splitting and for finding possible splits in the tree. One other thing it did is it, it achieves U-shaped learning on English past tense, so like a child does, right? So here, this, this dashed line is the ATP for the irregulars. You see, it does pretty well at first, then it gets worse, then it gets better again. So since this is more clear than Adam, you get this U-shape here. This ED model is a deep learning model that we were contrasting against, like a much bigger, more complicated machine learning model. It does not do U-shaped learning, because these aren't meant to work on child size data. And it also just does worse than us, even though we have a much simpler algorithm. Because we took into account these, these concepts about that we know about acquisition in general, specifically, not about machine learning in general. Uh, the deep learning model is much more general. And so this was, I think, my last slide. This was the final takeaway after all that. So just coming back to this language acquisition learning paradigm, if you take these into account, you know what a computational learner should achieve and on what data, what kind of outcomes it should get if we want it to be a model of language acquisition. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. We have um, we have plenty of time for some questions and discussion now. Um, and I don't know if anything's in the chat box or people can raise their little electronic hand or just speak up um, anyway. And I'm sure Jordan, you can follow them and choose your own questions. Okay, someone has their hand up. Yeah, I want to thank you very much, first of all, for the lecture that was really amazing and I learned a lot. And I wanted to ask a question that just came to my mind that if we we often say, like hear the phrase that nowadays children, they are smarter, they learn faster, they acquire things like faster than probably children did before. If um, if there is this kind of study or like based on papers that you you've checked like for due to 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 the acquisition of your expertise, is there any difference in the way how children acquire the language or some morphological peculiarities, how they did it in the past and how they are doing now? Is there like a speed difference or some kind of um, uh, the volume difference, if I may name it in this way? Oh, people have only started, only looked really carefully at child language acquisition for a few decades now. So we, we can't say for sure, because we can't look super far back. No one was recording child-directed speech earlier than the 1960s, really. My guess would be that for something like language acquisition, 
that there is no difference, even though they, there may be differences for other things that children learn later, like during school age. This really is what's one of the automatic things that happen to children, sort of like how learning to walk is automatic if you have the right motor control to do so, or learning how to see if, you're, if your eyes are functioning properly at the right age. This is sort of like, a, it's a biological thing that, that we do. I think, it's rel I think it would be relatively resilient to the external cultural input. But, it, but again, I don't think anyone has studied this. We don't really have enough long-term data yet on the question. And Thank you. I hope that I hope that answered your question. In, in some sort, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, we have another hand up. Uh, hello, thank you very much. I wanted just to ask you about if there are any data collected uh from bilingual children or children who live in a situation of diglossia or for example children uh is there any studies or any data collected uh from children who for example uh is mm, are not bilingual and they are not in a situation of diglossia but from the childhood mm, they have uh, they are in a linguistic situation when they uh, listen uh, foreign language frequently, or they, for example, watch movies or they listen to the music uh, in foreign language. So how how do they, because uh, my first question was about exactly about what you said about depends on age, how they perceive information, how they reproduce it. So uh, is there anything uh, about what I asked about bilingual and about diglossia and about children who just have this situation from time to time? Because I know uh, cases when a child, for example, um, he's not bilingual, he doesn't have anybody around English speaking, but as he's been watching him since he's like one year old age, uh, he been watching uh, series in English and cartoons in English. And so now he can produce like English words or English sentences just uh, in the right time. So he knows the sense, but he, <laughs> mm -hmm. he doesn't speak this language actually, but he understands. And when he produces another language, he is five at the moment. When he produces, so he produces exactly right. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not an expert in bilingual acquisition, but this is something that people do study. So at a high level, children in these bilingual situations, so if they're in a, so if their family speaks one language, but they're living in a community that speaks something else, for example, children will acquire both without much difficulty. They may, they may acquire both slightly later. It takes more time to get enough input in either language, but you can learn with constraints on just how much time you have to soak up input, essentially any number of languages natively, if you're in a multi-glossic situation. When it comes to uh, hearing a foreign language or watching it on television or something, I, I, I think the child you're talking about is doing exactly what you'd expect. The child might learn some words, might learn to pronounce them well, might learn their meanings, but they're not going to learn the entire language that way. Because while motherese and child-oriented speech themselves aren't critical for acquisition, still being immersed in that environment is critical. So, so I think that this child learning some English words, that's sort of what we would expect. Maybe he'll do a little better learning English as a second language later, I don't know. Yeah, but I think what you describe is what I would expect given this situation. Okay, thank you very much. But doesn't it mean, for example, if in the future, for example, this kind of children, uh, they can learn it, uh, they can learn actually the whole language uh, more rapidly, or for example, they have already any system inside the head as they produce the 
uh, information like in the exact time. So I'm just uh, actually I'm asking if there are any studies about this or if uh, someone collected already any data. I, I don't know actually because again I'm not a bilingual acquisition person. That does sound like something that someone might have looked at. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have another question. Uh, yeah, I have a bit of a silly question. It's about um, like really hypothetical situation, but there was an experiment kind of well um, con conducted by one computer by one linguist who wanted to make his child acquire a constructed language um, such as Klingon, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, the experiment failed, so it didn't go well, but it was only the father who was speaking this language to the child. So my, uh, and there is one more moment, the language itself is constructed and rather complex and um, the word production system that it's not really well developed. So my question is, um, if hypothetically there were two parents speaking this language and there are also books in this fictional language and um, uh, somebody would the theoretically um, make some well, make the possibility for the language to be simplified could it be possible for a child to acquire uh, this fictional language with uh, uh, two parents speaking it and with some media like books also being consumed and um, the second question is um, also constructed languages have um, little to no irregularities since they are constructed and would it be most and would be easier for a child to acquire constructed language because of this? Yeah. Okay. So to start with the first question, there are native speakers of Esperanto. So that's by far the most successful attempt at a constructed language. So it, it was, they're mostly old now because the Esperantists lived in general a long time ago. That language is meant to be sort of generically European rather than extremely complex and exotic. And so from that perspective, one could acquire constructed language and that perspective is not that different from any natural language. Klingon, which is from Star Trek, is deliberately complicated and different from most natural languages. So I don't know if there's, if there's anything in that constructed language that is just outside the realm of possible grammars, outside of our hypothesis space, then it would not be acquirable as is. But in principle, when a child, given both parents speaking it, given a community and other resources, they should be able to acquire it. What was your second question? Um, and the second was that um, constructed languages usually don't have any irregularities since they're constructed and while well, it's kind of out there. So yeah, it was connected to the first language to the first question. If it makes so, if, if it makes for child easier to acquire a constructed language than natural language because of this. And so I don't know because children, as we talk about productivity, can handle irregularity just fine. They'll do it. Okay. Whether or not it's easier or not, maybe because then they won't. They just won't have to deal with exceptions. I wouldn't be surprised if several generations of speakers learning it caused irregularities to be introduced. Like, how would Klingon evolve naturally if it were a human language? Yeah, but yeah, so children could probably acquire it, and it might be a little easier. Would be my okay answer, because they children have acquired Esperanto and other constructed languages. So the next okay. hand up was from Maggie. Hi. Uh, thank you for the really fascinating talk. Um, I was just wondering, because um, I think in the sort of the, the one of the most, most the more recent works that you mentioned, um, they were able to, you know, find regular and irregular patterns. Um, I think it was this was the ATP. Um, so, so I was just wondering, um, can you sort of briefly um, expand on like the methodology? Sorry. Um, yeah, can you briefly expand on the methodology that these um, 
these these sort of uh, uh, studies used. Um, yeah. Thank you. So I will bring up the, the slides again. So for this study, and we did it pretty typically, for the data set, what we did is we, we went through child lists for the relevant language, so for English and for German. We also used this to learn Mandarin noun classifiers, which will be published in later work. And for some Spanish, I think it was Spanish gender assignment as well. So what you go, you go through child lists, you extract all, say we're learning German nouns. We extract all of the nouns in the form that they come in. Uh, German child list tells us what case they were in as well. And then we extract the lemma. So then that, that gives you the data set, an estimation of the data that the child has been exposed to. And you get, you get frequency counts, so remember, the input is very sparse. We don't want to just throw all of the German nouns at the computational learner. That would be unfair. We want it to be realistic. And so then we're, we give this data set, or we just take the, we, estim, we estimate, say, what are the roughly the first 100 nouns that a child will learn by looking at the top 100 most frequent items in this data set? We can apply some jitter like to get different, slightly different top hundreds every time and run this for multiple trials or something. And then we run the system on that. Generally, not everyone uses frequency like this to get a good size data set. So the previous work on this deep learning model just used a big, bigger dictionary. So they had more training data, which is why they didn't mean it to work on child size training data. But otherwise, everyone uses pretty much the same paradigm training these systems. So then given these, say, 100 words or 250 words or 500 words, our, our learner goes through this list and we have, it, we have it look for patterns. So for hypotheses, if it, if it finds that some ending is quite frequent, then, then it can say, well, maybe this is the default for German noun plurals. And then you can use the tolerance principle to test. And there is no overarching default for German noun plurals. So that's going to come back false. The number of exceptions is too big. Then it will make a split. It'll try to make a condition, like say, so let's not look at all German nouns. Let's just look at the uh, feminine nouns instead. And then it would do the same process to see if there's any single thing that can capture all the data or most of the data. And if not, it'll uh, break down. It'll keep going down the down the decision tree. And it, that's the, the general idea. So this is, I'm guessing, like a um, supervised learning um, so this approach? Is, this is supervised yeah. in the extent that, uh, that it knows that we're giving it the plural and the lemma. So there's the assumption that the child is able to extract something mm -hmm. like the lemma or stem, but otherwise it's unsupervised. Sure, sure. Because That's that great. is again yeah. more like the realistic learning set. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. And so this paper, I can try finding it and put putting it in the chat. It, it just appeared recently. Yeah, actually that'd be great, yeah. And then while I'm doing that, I can take the next question, unless you have another part of your question. Um, I was going to actually ask if you have some um, other sort of related works or literature in this area. Um, yeah, so I will I will send the, the paper in the chat and that will have in the in the background section a bunch of other papers. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So you should be able to take a look at this. Cool. So this this is the preprint version, and uh, the the final version will show up in the program for this soon if it hasn't already. And That's great. Yeah. And then the, you can just I mean search for my name and you'll 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 find me. Okay. And, and the yeah. the full proceedings are going to be like two thousand pages. It's really awful. Thank you. Yeah. <sighs>
Okay. Oh yeah, and, and uh, thanks, Kirill, for all this stuff about the bilingual acquisition as well. Okay, so I can take the next question. From Lena. Yeah, hi, thank you for your talk. I actually have an addition to what Lydia asked. I would have put it in the chat, but my keyboard is stuck in Arabic somehow, sorry. Um, it's uh, concerning the question of how can children acquire a constructed language? And yes, they can. I know of a group of role players in Germany here that created their own tribe for role playing and they also created their own language. And now the first people, there's a lot of couples in that tribe, like real life couples that now raise their children in that constructed language. And they take their children to those events. And so they're, we now have the first speakers, native speakers of that created language within the role playing community in Germany, which is actually quite fun, I think. It really works. Um, and so for how long has it been going on? So how old are the children? Oh, that's like, they're, I think the oldest one is three years now. But ah, they okay. do speak that language, at least when they're in those events. Because another thing with that experiment was the fact that um, a child did learn some of the vocabulary and grammar. But the problem was that um, as they aged, um, they found this language to be like uncomfortable and not really useful. And that's why by the age of like 12, 13, like early teenage years, they have completely forgotten it. Just because yeah. they, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about that too. If I asked myself the same question, it's uh, really it interesting. Would, that it would help to have an active community around. Yeah, they, they, they do kind of have an active community and it's not uncommon for children to also adapt their parents' hobby of going to role-playing events. But um, yeah, I'm really curious about that too. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting, thank you. Sorry, Anna, was that question for me? No, it was for Kirill, sorry, like I say, <laughs> yeah, <Okay>. thank you. <laughs> I'm, I don't have an electric hand, an electronic hand, um, but I have a real hand. <laughs> um, so I just, uh, just you mentioned it at the well-known fact at the very beginning that we, we get worse at this um, as we get older. What is your sort of general take on that? Like the, the you like, why don't the algorithms that you showed us continue to function? Oh, really well. I don't know, but from what I've read about this and other critical period things, so like learning the visual processing or learning to walk. So th there, there are several of these things. And so then the question then is, why do we give up the ability to do this? One general account is that it is somehow costly to maintain it. So, so for example, when we're quite young, we get older, the number of neurons we have decreases. We're just not dealing, we don't need all this extra stuff anymore. I'm, I'm, and I'm not uh, a neuroscientist. I don't know to what extent that's a reasonable explanation for things. It seems like it would be, for humans in particular, quite beneficial if we retained the ability to acquire languages in a native-like fashion. Because our societies, we were very prone to coming in contact with one another and wishing we could communicate better. And migrating around and forming societies are both very human things to do. Yeah, but I... I wish there were a good explanation for why this fades. And it does fade. It, sometimes people talk about the critical period like you just fall off a cliff and it's over. But it really, it is a, really is a more gradual decrease. And sometimes people, so other than the, the neuroscience explanation, people have pro, uh, proposed things about uh, memory, for example, 
So by the time we're adults, we've learned a whole bunch of words. That's just all in the way for this other stuff. I'm not sure I, I maybe buy that less than uh, your argument. And do you have ideas or does anyone else, has anyone else read other things? I mean, words is the one thing that we do, we can do pretty well. We can, right. We can put our mind to it. But, but the morphological paradigms that you were talking about are notoriously hard to totally Or, or getting a native like phonology is hard. Yeah, or, yeah, not to mention phonology. You can get decades of input in a second language and not overcome your native accent. Yeah. I was just curious whether the computational models that you talk about have any story sort of built into them. So the, the tolerance principle as, an, as a nice one, in that it is much harder to overcome exceptions when your n is very large. That would be, there's, some, there's something about how much you already know that would make it harder. I don't think that's a full explanation, but it does produce a trend in the right direction. I think, interesting. Thanks. There's, I think there's a couple other hands too. Yeah. Omer has a question. Um, thanks. I just want to say about the, um, the critical period stuff. So if, if we're already talking about this, there's two like clarifications that are worth making. One is that while it's a fading thing and not a step function, what's important to note is that the claim about the critical period is not that everybody will suck at learning languages when they're 30. It's that it'll be like the ability to play the piano. Like there will still be people who like are almost like a five-year-old when they're in their thirties. But what disappears is the population wide, almost invariant, that falls off a cliff. And that's often misunderstood because then people will like will hold up like, look, this person achieved native ability in Yiddish when they were 32, which is like completely irrelevant to the claim being made. The other thing is that I, don't quite understand how the, the I, I know you, you, Jordan, weren't defending them, but you brought them up. So I feel kind of compelled to respond. Like how the idea about vocabulary getting in the way would work given that presumably the same would be true for staggered bilinguals. So I acquired my second native language starting at four years old and I'm speaking it to you right now. And somehow the vocabulary that I had until that point did not impede my ability to do so. And quite generally being bilingual or trilingual makes you weakly, mildly better at acquiring languages in adulthood, not worse. So this seems to go the wrong way. And the thing about neuron populations also absent a theory seems like people don't get half as good at learning foreign languages. They get really, really bad. Now, of course, you could have a theory where like having uh, uh, cutting the number of neurons in half would have like a nonlinear effect on the utility of your learning. But like, I guess John was asking for that theory, like just cutting the number of neurons is not explanatory on a, in and of itself. The claim isn't that it's you know, uniformly cutting neurons. It's cutting neurons in, in, air, in specific areas. Mm. So and the, the, strength of, the strength of this is then that's a related explanation for why you, you can't learn visual processing after a, a couple of years old. So children born with uh, congenital cataracts, we have a perfectly functioning visual system, except at the very front. If you correct, you can correct that. That's not a hard surgery, right? But it, it often doesn't happen in certain parts of the world. If you correct that too late, you can, you can read the accounts of people who had this done. They can they receive the visual information, but they can't make sense of it. So you get very strange things. Like I can tell when something's orange, but I can't tell you what shape it is. Or looking down a hallway, I know that it's supposed to converge like that, but I just see an X. Very strange stories like that. So th th there's, there is a more general process where we learn the ability to do things. Walking is another one. If you for some reason you can't learn to walk when you're a baby. Even if your legs work right, you're, you're just not gonna learn to walk without a strained gait. So I think that's probably part of the story, but not the whole story again. <laughs>
as for the vocabulary thing, remember that for even for staggered bilinguals, your vocabulary when you're four is still going to be quite a bit less than when you're 20. Again, I'm not trying to defend it, but I, that example maybe doesn't go quite as far as, as one might think. And what was the, the, oh yeah, then I liked the piano example. I like to talk about math skills. Like you can, like very smart people might be really good at math or really bad at math. It's just, a, it's, it's a thing like you are, the way you are. Some people are good at learning second languages and some aren't. But I think the main point is that we're transitioning from this uh, biological process of humans into our more general learning. Like we're, we're good at different kinds of learning. That's my take on it, at least. I do like the piano example, and I might use it in the future. Then, and then there's a question in the chat, and then we're running out of time. Yeah, I think that should be our, we have a three o'clock social event, which you're welcome to come to, Jordan, if you'd like, and um, keep the discussion. Um, and the, the um, so maybe this will take this as the last uh, last question. Well, as for a memory-based and information theory-based accounts, I would be shocked if someone has not already tried to do something that would account for the apple orange thing. So a lot of the, the information theory-based work on, on word learning talks about the difference between successive repetitions or providing several examples at once. So they'll make a claim that, that if I show you five oranges at once and say orange, you may learn differently than if I show you an orange and then an orange and then five times in a row. So one, one could do that. So the, the, there are accounts for that. I'm, I might not quite be understanding the question correctly though, so feel free to correct or rephrase. It is noticeable, notable, though, that, again, children learn from positive evidence without correction. That also has to do with memory and storage, right? So then why, why do they behave differently with explicit feedback? That might be different than just, just the memory and storage thing. It's the, the quality and type of information instead. So, because it could be, so again, this is like a two or three-year-old. They're, they're not the, the most adept humans at stuff in general. So acquiring language, again, it's an automatic thing like learning how to walk. But there's a reason why we don't teach algebra to two and three-year-olds. They're not, they're not just not great at reading the room and paying attention to the situation. So it could be that they're, that they're just not expecting to get explicit feedback. So the child just doesn't know what to do with this information. Like they don't, he doesn't understand that they're trying to change the word for this object. So that would again be, they're just, they're, they're not expecting explicit feedback. They're expecting language in use. And then, yeah, it's almost, Three o'clock. Yeah, and I think that brings us to our last question. So, uh, yeah, everyone feel totally free to come to the informal gathering that's starting soon. And uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. It was extremely interesting. I will end the.